Open your eyes to see wondrous things out of his word. And what you see, what you learn, what you receive. Will help you to glorify God more. To serve the Lord more acceptably. With reverence and godly fear will help you to prepare for eternity that God will make this place where you are the gateway to heaven preparing you for that wonderful glorious eternal city Let there be a willingness to learn and a willingness to do as the Lord says that your life will be directed and controlled, influenced by thus says the Lord and that you will be among those people that tremble at his word, having a contrite heart, a humble heart, humble spirit, that will willingly, cheerfully, faithfully, loyally, obediently carry on and carry through the word that he teaches. And pray that you will not be a forgetful hearer, always hearing, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Pray that you will not be dull of hearing. By that time, you ought to be teachers of the word yourself. You seem to be like babes that still have need of the milk rather than of the meat of the word. Pray that you come to maturity, adulthood. In the fold, in the flock, among the people of God. And pray that God will use what you hear, what you learn, to make you a real child of the kingdom. That you will not be a backslider right in the midst of the people of God. That you will not be like Pharaoh with a hardened heart who became a reprobate. As a young person, it's a privilege you have, like Samuel, to hear the word of the Lord and to have your life directed, controlled, ship, shaped by the word. The word of the Lord. Don't cast away this great pearl of great price. Appreciate it. Receive it. Hold it fast. Forsake it not. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for bringing us together tonight. We thank you because it's always a joyful scene and a great privilege to be in your presence, to learn your word with other children of God and the family of God. Lord, we pray that tonight, as your word comes out, it will reach every heart, every soul, and turn our spirits around towards you in Jesus' name. 
We pray, Lord, that this, this warlike fire will burn every chaff out of our lives in Jesus' name. Like water will wash and cleanse and purge and purify us and transform us and make us whiter than snow in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray the defilement of the human nature, the pride of the depravity of the fallen man, that today your word will come like a sword and cut everything away from us in Jesus' name. That this word like hammer will break and, sh and shatter all the rocky hearts in Jesus' name. That Lord, the, that kind of pride that comes in your presence and will not bow and bend and be contrite and be humble before you. We pray that the hammer of the word will shatter everything tonight in Jesus' name. Take hold of us and turn us in the right direction tonight. Because the kind of children you love to have in your presence, that our lives will bring glory and honor adoration unto you. We pray, Lord, that tonight you'll be glorified as we look at the word, as we study the word, as we learn the word, and as we pray to have your grace to obey in our hearts in Jesus' name. Let your spirit come along with the word. That Lord, the spirit of God will give us conviction. And then give us consecration. That Lord, our lives will be fully surrendered, submitted unto you. Thank you Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus name we pray. Thank you very much. We can see now, we're looking at Daniel chapter 4. We've been studying Daniel and... Uh, this uh, Daniel chapter 4 has quite a lot for every one of us. And the study tonight concerns everyone. It's a place many people have been. And there are many people that are still in such a place tonight. All over the world. And if there is any problem, if there is anything that shows the depravity of man, the body nature of man, the, the kind of heart that people have and God says, that is a reprobate. It is what we find in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, which the Lord eventually dealt with. And when the Lord dealt with him, and the Lord took the sword of the Spirit, and also the rod of judgment, and applied both the instruction as well as the indignation upon Nebuchadnezzar, by the grace of God, eventually Nebuchadnezzar realized, and he submitted himself unto the Lord, and this mark, evidence of depravity in him, the Lord cut it up, and he himself was able to testify that now I give glory to God, I honor the Lord, because the great problem of the fallen man that affects the whole of mankind that I had before, everything now is gone. And the reason we're studying it is so that we'll allow the same oppression of grace and the same power of the Spirit and the same influence of the Holy Spirit that came upon him and made such a change and such a transformation that we will allow the Lord tonight that he'll do that same work of grace in us and it's the power of his Spirit will work with the Scriptures in our heart effectually, effectively in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 37. Daniel chapter 4 verse 37. Now I, Daniel, sorry, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, tell me the rest, is able to abase. They that walk in pride, those who walk in pride, is able to to our base. By the way, you want to understand that Nebuchadnezzar just told us now a timeless truth, an eternal truth. A statement that is true from generation to generation. A statement you cannot even modify. You cannot say that was true at that time and that is no more true today. Why do we say that? We're looking at Matthew chapter 23 and we're looking at verse 12. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12. A new server shall exalt himself, shall the watch abase. Exactly the words that... And if Kadnezza used that day, that walk in pride, is able to abase. And here comes the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And then he tells us that everyone, whosoever, 
whosoever he may be, no matter his position in the world, or no matter his knowledge, no matter his privilege, no matter his usefulness in the world. It says, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And that's what Jesus Christ said, and that is still true today. And the Lord is teaching us this from the life of Nebuchadnezzar because after the Lord had brought the judgment, the indignation, the wrath, the chastisement, the divine discipline upon Nebuchadnezzar, he learned this one solitary single important lesson that we, we must not be proud in our lives, in our hearts, because those who walk in pride is able and you will abase. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. Daniel chapter 5. We're looking at verse 18. O thou king, the most high God, give Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up. And his mind had it in pride. You see that his heart was lifted up because of his wealth, his riches, and because of his kingdom, because of his power, and because of his dominion, because of his authority, and because of the people that he had dominion over. It says his heart was lifted up. And his mind had it in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men. And his sight was made like the beasts. And his dwelling was with the wild asses. And they fed him with the grass like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled, ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over each whomsoever he will. That's the lesson he eventually learned. But before he learned that, the Lord showed him how God, the God of heaven, is against pride. In any shape and any form, in anyone, at any time, in any nation, in any generation. He learns the lesson eventually, but that was at a later time in his life when he learns the lesson that he should have learned earlier in life. He had received revelations of the collapse of human kingdoms. That's in chapter 2. And the replacement of superior empires with inferior powers. He learns that in chapter 2 from the interpretation of Daniel. And the importance of pagan religion. Yet his pride remains untouched. How many people have learned many great lessons and they have had great revelations and they have read the inspired word of God over and over like Nebuchadnezzar had the opportunity to learn from Daniel and yet their pride still remains intact and their haughtiness still remains untouched and their lives still remain untransformed he had seen the great manifestations of the presence of God and the power of the Almighty. And he had been warned by God's heavenly and earthly messengers, both prophets and angels, warned him a watcher from heaven, speaking to him that judgment was coming. But he was still full of pride until a great unprecedented punishment came from heaven upon him. Nebuchadnezzar's pride was inherent in his nature. He liked independence and he acted independently of any superior authority. And that's, the, and that's why people are proud. If you are proud, that's the reason you are proud. You want to be independent of any superior authority. 
nobody above you. You don't recognize anyone that has any word to say, anything to say. You are the all in all. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, his empire, his success, his vast dominion, and the privilege or the prestige of conquest made his heart to be lifted up and his mind to be hardened in pride, boasting of his vast dominion. He, he, he was proud of his wisdom. He was proud of his power. He was proud of his accomplishment. Wrapped in the thought of his greatness. He was forgetful of God. And he was independent of his creator. When people have achieved a little success. When they have had a little things to gather together. Of the sand and the mud. And able to build what they call the mansion. Not understanding that all that is just sand and mulch. And when they have been able to collect some things together and some parts of the wood of the forest, they have caught in peace and made some of this furniture that looks very, very nice. Not understanding everything is dug from the ground. And then they become so pompous and so proud as if they have the whole of the world. That was the case of Nebuchadnezzar. And then his judgment gives us a very solemn warning against pride and being glory with all this ability he had nothing which he had not received from god and think about it the clothes you wear you didn't manufacture that the wool from that from where that came from and everything you have everything you can lay hand upon the books you read the knowledge you have the skill you have the experience you have the success you have Everything comes from God. There is nothing to be proud of. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter four verse seven. First Corinthians chapter four verse seven. Who makes thee to differ from another? What are you proud about? What are you haughty, pompous about? What's lifting you up? What's making your head, your mind to swell up? Why you, why you have been glory? What have you got that has not been given to you for what? Who makest thee to differ from another? Or what, and what hast thou that has, that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hast not received it. And that was the problem of Nebuchadnezzar. He was thoughtless. He wasn't thinking. Do you ever think in your life, and you look at your life while the devil is whispering to you, how great you are, how wonderful you are, how beautiful, how handsome you are, how rich, how wealthy you are, how popular you are. Have you ever thought about it, that everything you have to the minutest detail was given to you by the Almighty God, and now you are forgetful of that God. You are independent of that God. What have you got that has not been given to you? And if you are misusing that which has been given to you, as if independently you have acquired it yourself, what arrogance is that? What pride is that? What haughtiness is that? Whoever plumes himself, that will plume, and that's like, you know, you put on the feathers of a peacock. And then you become so proud. And then you clothe yourself with kinds of colorful feathers. And then you think, I'm the, I'm the king of the birds. I'm the, I'm the highest, I'm the most beautiful, whoever, whosoever, plumes himself upon what he has done in the world. As if he were the author of it all. And not simply an instrument in the hand of God. is really as proud and haughty as Nebuchadnezzar was. The businessman who speaks of his business as the sole result of his ability. Or the, or the rich man who calls himself with supreme satisfaction the architect of his own fortunes. Or the professional who thinks of his accomplishment as the creation of his own genius. Or the successful man who looks upon his position as entirely self-made all alike are guilty of Nebuchadnezzar's sin for they have shot God out of their hearts and they have not given him the honor the glory to which uh, he is entitled let us be closed with humility and wherever we are and whatever we have let us acknowledge God and submit under his authority. In fact, Isaiah chapter 10 verse 15 tells us you have nothing to be proud of. 
nothing to be proud of. And it gives us a pertinent, practical, important illustration in uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 15. Isaiah 10. I'm reading from verse 15. Shall the earth boast itself against him that he was there with? It's saying, here is an ass. And the ass is saying, I am sharp. I am solid. I am effective. Well, the ass boast itself against him that he was there with. What if the man did not lift up the ass? What if the hand of man did not touch and lift up and use the ass? What will the ass do by itself? What if the hand of the Almighty God has not taken hold of you to make use of you and to put you in a place of responsibility? What would you be in life? And then it goes on in that verse 15, Or shall the soul magnify itself against him that shaketh it? What can the soul do? And what can the soul cause? If there is no hand that is shaking or moving that saw, that's what he's saying. And then it says, as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself, as if it were no wood. He's saying, you're still ordinary wood, you're still ordinary human being. And if you accomplish anything in life at all, it's because of what God decides to do. And he's telling us, be humble. There's nothing to be proud of against your neighbor or against the almighty god because everything you know everything you have everything you can do every place you find yourself every success you achieve everything is coming from the almighty god and there's nothing you could have done by yourself without the divine help we're looking at this study tonight divided into three parts number one the perception and personification of pride perception to understand what pride is when pride is being manifested not judging other people looking at yourself looking at the mirror of the word of god tonight and say i see myself i see my face in the mirror i see my heart i see my attitude i see my disposition looking at yourself not judging other people the perception and the personification of pride number two the punishment and the perdition of the proud the punishment and the perdition of the proud and then number three to avoid eternal punishment which by the way Nebuchadnezzar avoided he escaped eternal punishment he escaped that endless eternal everlasting wrath of god because there was a change here on earth and that's why we're studying that's why we're studying if we only study and the study benefits us only in this world we are most men most miserable of all men most miserable the reason we study is so that we'll be able to escape the judgment of god and then there must be purging and preservation from pride if we're going to enjoy eternal fellowship with the almighty god point number three then the purging and preservation from pride point number one the perception and personification of pride we're looking at daniel chapter 4 daniel chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 28 daniel chapter 4 verse 28 all this came upon the king nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of babylon then King, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon? Stop there for a moment. Uh, generally, if you are poor, sometimes you have, you have nothing to be proud of. You are a poor man, you have nothing to put on, you have nothing to eat, you have no shelter, you have no house, you have no certificate, you have no children, you, you have nothing. Uh, like Lazarus, you are humble. And then you're depending upon other people. Can you let me this? Can you give me this? Can you help me? And uh, almost a beggar. Nothing to be proud of. But it, it's when, when God has given you the chance, the opportunity to be somewhere. The opportunity to be something. And God takes a nobody and makes him a somebody. And God could have taken another person there because he says that God ruled in the kingdom of man and he appointed 
whomsoever he will. He could have appointed another person. In fact, he says he appoints the basest of men. The basest of men. The basest of men. Without, uh, you know, going into any kind of politics, you understand? Look at all the countries, all the countries of the world. From the greatest to the smallest. It's not the, it's not the most scientific mind that is the president of a country. And it is not the most mathematical mind that is the president of any country. And it's not the most knowledgeable in technology that is the president of any country. God chooses anybody. And if you are there today, like Nebuchadnezzar, understand, it's not because of what you know, it's not because of what you have, 